Today on Bold Steps, Pastor Mark Job gives a word of encouragement to those who are waiting. From the day you were born, God has always seen you. He's always known you. You have never been a number to God. You've been an individual. And you say, well, where was God when I was suffering? He was there the whole time. And he's followed your story. And he's cared about you because he's the God that sees. Welcome to Bold Steps with Mark Job, Senior Pastor of New Life Community Church in Chicago and President of Moody Bible Institute. On today's program, we're continuing our study of the book of Genesis. As we turn our attention to chapter 16, we'll discover the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. God had promised a child to Abraham and Sarah, but because they were impatient, they decided to take matters into their own hands. And in so doing, they caused huge problems, not only for themselves, but for us too. Mark is going to share the details right now with our message, Keeping Your Faith Fresh While You Wait. They went and they hid themselves in the garden, and when God went to look for them, what did God say? Eve, Eve, where art thou? No. He said, Adam, Adam, where are you? He didn't call for Eve, he called for Adam. Finally, when Adam showed up in front of them, Adam said, well, I was hiding, and it's the woman you gave me. I mean, God, I didn't have a choice. It's not like you created three and said, pick one of them. I mean, you gave me one. I mean, it's the woman you gave me. I had no choice. Of course, Eve said, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. But what I want you to understand is that if you're the leader, if God has placed you in a position of responsibility, then it doesn't matter who's pressuring you. Don't blame it on your wife. Don't blame it on your kids. Don't blame it on your mother-in-law. Don't blame it on your peers. You take responsibility for your decisions because ultimately you are responsible for the decisions that you make. And so Sarah says, Sarah said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, literally. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think is best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she left and she fled. Here's what I want you to know, that oftentimes uh, leaders, or if you're in a responsibility of leadership... There's two temptations that a leader has. Number one, to be a passive leader. A passive leader is someone that's not willing to make the tough decisions. He abdicates his decision-making power. You know, those things are going wrong. The house is going in the wrong direction. He's just passive. He's just sitting on the couch with another Dunkin' Donuts dribbling down his stained T-shirt. I don't know, honey, you know, that, that, you deal with it. Get off your chair. Do something about it. Don't be a passive leader. That is your family. That is your household. Uh, that, that, that's your checking account. Ah, uh, my wife's got, gotten us in a big mess. She just doesn't handle the finances. Well, hey, start doing something about it. I mean, this woman can't handle the kids. I mean, they're out of control. Yeah, her kids? Yeah, her kids are out of control. Wait a second. Have you ever noticed when they're misbehaving, it's her kids, and when they're doing well, it's our kids? (laughs) Passive leadership abdicates its responsibility. So there's passive leadership. Abraham was passive. Sarah said, hey, how about this? Okay. And then when there was a problem... She said, well, what are you going to do about it? He said, I don't know. You do something about whatever you want to do. He was passive in his leadership. The second problem or mistake that we make is not passive leadership, but often it's what I call political leadership. That means it's whatever's popular. I mean, what is everybody saying? Uh, Is this a popular decision? And instead of drawing a line in the sand, we go with whatever is popular, like the politicians who do polls and find out, well, do people really like this or if they don't, because they're looking for the votes, they're looking for popularity. Abraham 
failed in this area when it came to Hagar. He really blew it because he was passive and he was political in his leadership. Look at what Proverbs 29, 25 says. The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. I think every leader at some time in their life, leaders need to know that you do what is right before God, whether it's popular or not. And listen, if you're a leader in your household, in your business, in the church, in a home group, or whatever it is, listen, when you are at the helm, then you are responsible for those decisions, even if people may be pressuring you to do something. If you know it's wrong, you don't do it because ultimately you will be responsible before God. And it's not going to work to say, well, she pressured me into it, or he did, or he did, or she did. Remember, never sacrifice truth for peace. So Abraham realized at that time that he had made a mistake and it created more problems and now no one's happy. His wife's not happy because Hagar's despising her. Hagar's not happy because Sarai's mistreating her. And if the women aren't happy, Abraham's not happy because he's living in a house where there's a lot of chaos and he thought that he had solved the problem. You see, he left the waiting room out of the door of compromise and created a lot of problems in his life. The fourth point I want you to understand about the place of compromise or the waiting room is this. I want you to write this down. Huge. Never forget that God's mercy is available to those caught in the web of someone else's shortcut. I love this part. Because the real victim in all of this, you know who it was? Hagar. Here's a young girl who's basically a slave in his household. And she has very little power over this. And now because Abraham slept with her, she's pregnant, she's despised, she's caught in someone else's turmoil. Have you ever felt like that? There may be some of you here that your parents are going through a divorce and it's nasty and they're fighting with each other and they're arguing all the time and I mean your house is one big mess and then they're fighting over custody. No, no, I get her, no, you get her, you get her on weekends and I get her at this time and the kids are caught in the middle and they may be saying, hey, why are we going through this? God, why am I in the middle of this? I mean, this is so unfair. I had nothing to do with it, yet I'm in the middle of it. Maybe you're a spouse and your husband is caught in the web of addiction. And your house is going up for foreclosure because, you know, he's gambled it all away or drank it all away or not managed it because he's got a major addiction problem. And you're caught in the middle of it and your kids are caught in the middle of it. And you may say, this is so unfair. God, why am I in the middle of it? It's really not my fault, but I'm caught in this web. Maybe you're working at your job and your boss has made some bad financial decisions and now your whole company is in an uproar and people are being laid off and there's tension at work and you're feeling the strain of it and everybody's coming down hard on you and you're saying, God, this was not my problem, but I'm caught in the mess of someone else's problem. Maybe you're a grandmother here and you're son or daughter has not been able to take care of their kids and so the kids have been dumped in your lap and you thought you were done being a parent and now you're raising your kids sons and daughters because they were unable to manage it and you feel like God what happened here I mean why am I caught in the middle of their mess how many of you know what I'm talking about this morning you can relate to that being caught in the middle of someone else's mess well here's what I want to tell you I love this part of the story because Hagar finds herself in verse 7. It says at the end of verse 6 that she fled from her. In verse 7 it says, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I love this, that God found her. She didn't find God, God found her. Don't you love that? 
Don't you love that God finds us in the middle of our desert? I mean, there Sarah is, a young pregnant girl in the middle of the desert thinking, I have no place to go. I've been kicked out of my house. How unfair is this? No one cares. It's not my fault, and here I am. Yet I love that in the middle of the desert, God cares. And God finds her in the middle of the desert, and not only does he find her, but God speaks to her. Some of you may be in the middle of a desert right now thinking, no one knows what I'm going through. There may be a young girl here that's so full of pain and anger inside that she's cutting herself and wearing long sleeves to school because she doesn't want anybody to know that she's so full of pain that she's cutting herself. There may be a college student here that is so distressed over life and so wants significance and values that she's fallen into an eating disorder. And, and you know what? Every time she eats, she goes to the bathroom afterwards and she throws up and she's caught in this cycle of bulimia because and no one knows about it and everybody thinks she's doing so well. But you know what? She just has this terrible image of herself and she's caught in this cycle of bulimia. And she thinks, I'm all alone in this. No one really knows. No one really cares. No one sees what I'm going through. No one knows the pain that I'm in. She's in the middle of the desert. But I want to say that God does. I want to say that God does care. That's such an important thing to remember. God does see what's going on around us, and He has a plan. And you have a purpose in that plan. We'll return to our message from Mark Job on Bold Steps in just a moment. But let me remind you that all of these daily lessons are also available for listening anytime on our website, boldsteps.org. And if you'd ever like to hear these Bible teachings while you're out on the go, perhaps on your way to work or even during a workout, you'll want to subscribe to our podcast. You'll find us on most of the major podcast apps by searching for Bold Steps with Dr. Mark Job. Just don't forget to click subscribe where you're there and leave us a message and a five-star review to help others find the program. And also, did you know that you can find videos of Mark's teachings, even more Bold Steps content available on our brand new Bold Steps app? Whatever your interest, you'll find both long and short form videos that speak to relevant topics and issues in your daily life. Open up your favorite app store today and download it for free. Right now, let's get back to the message. Mark calls it keeping your faith while you wait. So in the middle of the desert, the Bible says that the Lord came to her and he asked her a couple questions. How many of you know that when God asks a question, it's not that he doesn't know the answer? If God asks a question, he's not looking for an answer that he doesn't know. He's asking you to dig into your soul because he wants you to know that there's answers inside of you. And he asked her this question, where did you come from? And where are you going? Hey, God, didn't you know that? And did you know she came from Sarah's household? Didn't you know that she was from Egypt? Didn't you know she was a slave? Hey, and don't you know that she's in the middle of the desert and doesn't know where she's going? Uh, I believe that God was asking a question much deeper than that. I think God was asking, hey, Sarah, hey, Hagar, where did you come from? What are your roots? You were a slave before. You were from Egypt before. Where did you come from? And Hagar, hey, where are you going? You may not know, but I have a future, and I have a destiny, and I have a purpose, and I have a plan for your life. Hagar looks up, and God asks her a where question, and she answers with the who question. A who who answer. She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. How many of you know that in the middle of the desert, when God speaks to us, he doesn't always tell us what we want to hear? When you're in the middle of a hard time, you want someone to say, hey, escape to the Bahamas. A lot of times God says to us, go back to your problem, face it, and deal with it. So I'm in the desert here. I'm looking for God to give me direction. I've listed my top three places, San Diego, Hawaii, 
in Orlando, Florida, God, choose where do you want to send me? God says, go back home. God, I'm still listening. <laughs> Normally, God says, don't run from your problem. Go face your problem and deal with it. Here's what I want you to know. God was telling you to go back to Sarah. It was an unfair situation, yet God said, go back, deal with it. Sarah hadn't changed. God was saying, I'm going to change you and send you back to Sarah. Some of you don't want to hear that. You're going through a tough time in your marriage right now. You don't want to hear go back and work it out. You want to hear escape. The Bible says that God said to her, in verse 10, the angel added, And I will increase your descendants, and they will be too numerous to count. In other words, hey, I'm going to make you a mother and grandmother and great-grandmother. In fact, I'm also going to make you the mother of a great nation. Look what he tells her. He says to her, you are now with child, and you will have a son, and you will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. Oh, I love that, that God had heard of your misery. She hadn't gone unnoticed to God. Verse 12, and he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. I don't know how you would feel if you had a prophecy that said, hey, what's he going to be like? Oh, he's going to be like a wild donkey. Okay? He's going to be like a wild donkey, and his hand's going to be against everyone, and everybody's hand's going to be against sin, and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. Who would his brother be? Isaac was one of his brothers, and out of Ishmael came the entire Arab nation. But God was giving hope to Hagar. He was telling her, I have a plan, I have a destiny, I'm going to make a nation come out of you. And I want you to see what Hagar responds, I love her response. Listen to what she says. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. You see, she didn't even know God up to that time because she had come from Egypt where they worshiped pagan gods. And she had lived in Abraham's household and learned something about Yahweh, the true and living God. But she didn't even have a real relationship with him. And suddenly she realized this God cared about her. This God saw her. This God had not abandoned her. So she says, you are the God who sees. Have you ever seen at a Sox game, in between the plays, how they scan the audience. They scan around and everybody's talking and eating their popcorn and hot dogs and then suddenly the camera will zoom in on one person. They don't even know they're being watched but they realize, aha! You know why? He's the God that sees. And even when you don't know that God is looking, He's looking. He zoomed right in on you. You may not know it, but he's watching. And you may say, no one even knows what I'm going through, but God knows. You see, he's the God that sees. He's the God that hears. He's the God that knows. And she says, I now have seen the one who sees me. See, I have finally seen, I finally had a vision of the God who's always seen me. Here's what I want you to know. From the day you were born, God has followed your tracks and your story. From the day you were born, God has always seen you. He's always known you. He's never last, lost track of you. You have never been a number to God. You have never been a faceless person to God. You've been a name and a person. You've been an individual. And you say, well, where was God when I was suffering? He was there. And where was God when I was in the desert? He was watching you. And where was God? God, when injustice was happening to me, he was there the whole time. And he's followed your story. And he's cared about you because he's the God that sees. (laughs) 
Verse 15, so Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to his son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. I want to remind you of what it tells us. In Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You see, sometimes we feel like God is so lofty, so far, so distant, so unable to relate to our pain. But through Jesus, the Bible tells us that he is able to relate to our pain and sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. You have a high priest that you can come to. You have a mediator that you can come to that understands weakness and hurt and pain and sorrow. He is able to sympathize and empathize with your struggle. Let me ask you this. Do you have a vision that God has given you, but that you're trying to fulfill through the wrong door? Are you in the waiting room right now? Maybe you have been waiting for a long time and you have your hand on the handle of compromise or disobedience and you're saying, I'm not waiting any longer. I'm out of here. God is speaking to your heart, not through that door, not through that door, not through that door. Maybe you're here and you try, you've been trying to accomplish in the flesh what God called you to do in the spirit. Or maybe you're in the waiting room getting very impatient through the door of compromise. Maybe you're in the middle of the desert right now feeling like God hasn't seen or doesn't care what I'm going through. And I want to say he does. Learning to be patient while we wait for God. You're listening to Bold Steps with Mark Job, a message called Keeping Your Faith While You Wait. If you're curious to know more about God and His life-changing plan for your life, be sure to keep listening right here each weekday as Mark teaches straight from God's Word in a fresh and bold way. And then be sure to visit our website at boldsteps.org and visit our social media pages to join in the community of like-minded believers taking the next step in their walk of faith. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and even YouTube. Well, these days, identity is a hot topic, and many people, including Christians, are having a hard time finding confidence and clarity in what really defines them. That's why we're excited to announce a special book as our new Bold Step gift. It's titled Stop Trying. In it, author Carrie Schmidt compassionately guides us through the process of letting go of our self-made identities and embracing the one God has for us. If you've ever felt like you're living a hollow life or struggling under the weight of others' expectations, this book is for you. Don't miss this opportunity to receive, not achieve, your real identity. Reach out today and let us know you want a copy of Stop Trying when you make a donation of any amount to Bold Steps. Just call us at 800-D-L Moody. That's 800-356-6639 or give your gift online at boldsteps.org. And while you're on that website, please consider partnering with us this year to reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. These special monthly givers are called Bold Partners, and when you commit to giving a monthly gift of $30 or more, we'll be sure to send you a link for 50% off any selection in the entire Moody Publishers store online. Please sign up today at boldsteps.org. Well, Mark, for those people you call the runners today, or those who have the vision but are trying to fulfill it on their own power, give us a final word of encouragement if you would. Some of you are the runners that you heard about in this message. You've been running from God. You've been running from your calling. And um, I want to pause right now and say, it's time to stop running. Mm. You know, the love of God will chase you. He is persistent. He will pursue you. And some of you know that God has been pursuing you. You've seen the signs. You've felt the compelling call of God. And so right now, I'd like for you to stop, and some of you for the first time in a long time say, God, I'm done running. And I'd like to pray for you. Father, I pray for that person that has been trying to pursue their own way of living, avoiding the call to obedience, uh, running from your presence. But Lord, as they wake up today, they realize how tired, how it's not working, how life outside of you is nothing but messes. And so today, I pray in Jesus' name that they would turn their heart back to you, God, 
that they would take the first step to say, God, I'm done running and I'm walking towards you, God. And whatever that means for their family, for church, for ministry, for reconciliation, for their marriage, whatever it means, I pray that you would give them the power, the grace, the strength, the ability, and the desire to make their way back to you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Mark. We'll see you next time. And thank you for listening today. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us next time. And Mark continues this series called Don't Stop Believing. We'll be discussing how a new future requires a new identity. It's coming up Thursday on Bold Steps with Mark Jo. Bold Steps is a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute.